1962, the world almost ended. It was the Cold War. Soviet nuclear missiles were in Cuba, pointed at Washington, D.C. American missiles were in Turkey, pointed at Moscow. Thirteen days of unbearable geopolitical tension that mercifully relaxed after deals, public and secret, between world leaders. The Cuban Missile Crisis is widely considered to be the hottest the Cold War ever got. Our brush with the apocalypse isn't particularly surprising when you learn just how far the United States and the Soviet Union were willing to go. Just four years before Kennedy and Khrushchev would butt heads, both superpowers asked their scientists to consider the same absurd demonstration of power, nuking the moon. We would have never found out about this plan if one of the original researchers hadn't had its details included in his biography. Why pay attention to the biography of some egghead from the 50s? because it was the biography of the most influential science communicator of all time. This is the true story of Project A119. Seven years after definitively demonstrating that a small nuclear weapon could easily annihilate tens of thousands of people in less time than the blink of an eye, in 1952, the United States built and tested something even worse. The first thermonuclear hydrogen or H-bomb, a nuclear bomb that uses fission to initiate fusion. Nine months later, on August 12, 1953, the Soviet Union detonated its own fusion bomb. The Cold War was heating up. Four years after that, the Soviets had a firm advantage. Placed in orbit by a Russian rocket, one of the great scientific feats of the age. They had successfully launched the first artificial satellite, named Sputnik, into space. Timelines were speeding up. 28 days later, a piece in the Pittsburgh Press that read, quote, The latest rumor going the rounds is that the Russians plan to explode a rocket-borne H-bomb on the moon on or about November 7th. If that's true, look out. We can't know for sure what caused the convergence. Rumors, propaganda, the space race, all of the above. But months later in 1958, the United States and the Soviet Union were both looking to the moon as a demonstration of domination. The Soviet plan was reportedly called Project E-4 and included details for smashing an impact trigger fusion bomb into the lunar Maria, as well as a mission to image the moon's far side. The American plan was called Project A-119. Led by physicist Leonard Rifle, Project A-119 was a 10-person team tasked with exploring the possibility of exploding a nuclear bomb on the moon such that it would be visible to the naked eye from Earth for everyone to see. The foremost intent was to impress the world with the prowess of the United States, Dr. Rifle would later reflect. Joining him was Gerard Kuiper, considered by many to be the father of modern planetary science and of Kuiper Belt fame, and Kuiper's doctoral student, an aspiring young scientist named Carl E. Sagan. Why explode a nuclear bomb on the moon in the first place? The absurdity of the idea is absorbed by the tensions at the time. It was the Cold War. It was the space race. And America was behind. The same year that Sputnik crossed the Kármán line, NASA's Vanguard rocket, which was trying to put an American satellite into space, exploded on launch. The first and most spectacular of these was Vanguard at the end of 1957. There were other Vanguard failures, all achieved takeoff, but trouble occurred either in the second or third stages. The next attempt exploded shortly after launch. The third time was the charm. Good news from Project Vanguard, very good news indeed for all America. Still, the two previous and highly publicized failures no doubt in part created the atmosphere in which an idea like nuke the moon wasn't immediately dismissed. Keep in mind, all of this was a decade before the moon landing in 1969. No one had been to the moon yet. So, definitively demonstrating that you can reach the moon, more importantly demonstrated that you can reach anywhere on Earth. And with a nuclear weapon, no less. That ought to give the Reds a scare of their own. But not every reason for nuking the moon was so political. 
there was a case to be made that an enormous explosion could have scientific value too. Getting scientists to actually endorse that case, however, was another story. Almost 200 pages of Project A119 have been declassified and are freely available online. What's interesting about it is that everyone who reads the remaining pages today comes to the same conclusion. The scientists did not think nuking the moon was a good idea. Quote, It is certain that unless the climate of world opinion were well prepared in advance, a considerable negative reaction could be stimulated. This not-so-subtle language pervades the document. The scientists acknowledge the military objectives and political motivations for a demonstration like this up front, and then they spend the next 190 pages explaining why the scientific merit of a lunar detonation is a stretch at best. Quote, Obstacles to detonation of a nuclear weapon on the moon, from a scientific standpoint, center around environmental disturbance, biological contamination, and radiological contamination. The moon in 1958 was a relatively unknown quantity. We didn't know exactly what its atmosphere or magnetic field was like, or if it had them. We didn't know exactly how the moon formed. We didn't know if there could be life there, hiding in lunar permafrost. The report has page after page detailing this lack of details and advising caution because of it. If the moon has no atmosphere, it is perfectly positioned to measure radiation in space. Radiological contamination from a blast makes that difficult. If the moon has life somewhere on its surface, a nuke and possible pathogens from Earth riding the instrumentation through space could wipe it out. If you want to study the moon's interior with seismic waves, why bring a bomb? If one wished to proceed at a more leisurely pace, seismographs could be emplaced upon the moon. Such a course would appear to be the obvious one to pursue from a purely scientific viewpoint. Even 70 years later, you can almost hear Rifle and his team hemming and hawing. How else should we read unparalleled scientific disaster? The possible contamination of strange new worlds is something that NASA takes very seriously today. There are scientists and engineers whose whole job is the sterilization of spacecraft. It's a kind of prime directive that robots, probes, and or people should endeavor to interfere with the ecosystem as little as humanly possible, no matter the potential discovery. The authors of the Project A119 report make it very clear that they did what they could with what little they had. That's why Gerard Kuiper suggested the team bring on his graduate student from the University of Chicago. His job was to mathematically model the expansion of an exploding gas and dust cloud into space around the moon, and to determine if that cloud would be visible from Earth. According to Rifle, young Carl Sagan had a lot of trouble with this. Also according to Rifle, Sagan had trouble keeping secrets. What the A119 report doesn't say explicitly at least in the incomplete, unclassified copy, is whether or not you could actually see a nuclear explosion on the moon with the naked eye, from Earth, with the weapons available at the time. There are a lot of details on the optics. There are diagrams about what size luminous sphere would be visible on a dark or light moon. But there isn't one sentence about what kind of nuclear weapon would be needed to produce a cosmic fireball of the required size, or indeed if the United States even had those devices in its arsenal. Perhaps the scientists writing the report, given all the subtext in their conclusions, didn't need or want to do that part of the military's work for them. You ask for what size sphere you need, and this is all we're giving you. This is pure speculation on my part, of course, but it would fit with the many not-so-subtle pushbacks in the paper. So, did the United States have a large enough nuclear weapon in the 1950s to produce a blast on the moon that would be visible from Earth? Against a lighter moon? No. No weapon ever tested, not even the Tsar Bomba, had a fireball radius that big. But against a darker moon, where a bright blast bulb could really shine? Most definitely. Six years before the A119 report, the United States detonated the world's first fusion, or H-bomb, during the Ivy Mike test. Two years after that, in 1954, the Castle Bravo thermonuclear test. It remains the largest bomb the United States has ever detonated. It was a disaster. A second Hiroshima. But that's a story 
for another time. The minimum diameter luminous sphere that could be seen from Earth with the naked eye under the best conditions was calculated to be 0.4 miles. The diameter of the Castle Bravo fireball? More than double that. So the United States did in fact have a device that could send a message to the Soviets and the world that space belonged to Uncle Sam. All it would take is a fusion bomb strapped to a giant rocket getting safely to the moon more than 10 years before Apollo 11 did. However, according to a New York Times interview in 2000, Leonard Rifle said that the Air Force ruled out a hydrogen bomb because of the difficulty of flying the heavier weapon 230,000 miles to the moon. It's not in the declassified report, but Dr. Rifle said that the plan called for a device about the same size of the atomic bomb that leveled Hiroshima. The fireball that engulfed that Japanese city in 1945 was not a half a mile wide, but the bomb's yield would produce the minimum fireball radius in the report, even though those optics don't consider the luminosity of the moon. But why do we know any of these numbers? Why did Dr. Rifle talk about any of this top secret work in the first place, 40 years later? Well, according to him, he wanted to set the record straight. The record he was setting straight? the posthumous biography of a one Carl Sagan. The Earth would lose one of its greatest advocates to cancer on December 20th, 1996. Carl Sagan was 62. But before Sagan left this pale blue dot, author Key Davidson was looking into every facet of his life for a biography. With thorough research, he found Sagan's name on two old papers, possible contribution of lunar nuclear weapons detonations to the solution of some problems in planetary astronomy from 1958, and radiological contamination of the moon by nuclear weapons detonations from 1959. The document titles were listed on Sagan's application for an academic scholarship at the Miller Institute of the University of California, Berkeley, also in 1959. Davidson wrote that this constituted a violation of national security and said as much in his biography, Carl Sagan, A Life, published three years after the astronomer's death. Davidson didn't mince words. Sagan decided to confide to the fellowship judges information that he was required by federal law to keep secret, writes Davidson. He revealed his research at the Armour Research Foundation on the remote detection of lunar nuclear explosions. He must have known the risk he was taking. The information was classified. Washington did not look kindly on the leaking of nuclear information. A review of Davidson's biography in the scientific journal Nature didn't mince words either, this time in regards to the author, not the subject. Quote, To level the grave charge that someone illegally revealed classified nuclear information, a reporter has a responsibility to provide evidence for the allegation. Davidson does not. Whether Sagan really did reveal classified information, the review in Nature nevertheless confirmed the existence of, quote, various classified papers on scientific information to be gained from possible lunar nuclear detonations. And now, dozens of pages of those papers were about to be unclassified because another scientist also had a strong reaction to the Nature article. Project A119 lead, Leonard Rifle. Six months after the review of Sagan's biography, Dr. Rifle decided to set the record straight in a letter to Nature. He confirmed Project A-119, its objectives, the hiring of Sagan, the scientific snark that was in the original report. The cost to science of destroying the pristine lunar environment did not seem of concern to our sponsors, he writes, but it certainly was to us. But unlike the Nature Review, Rifle cited against Sagan, even though he denounced the work they both did. Quote, In my opinion, Sagan breached security in March 1959 when he revealed classified projects on possible lunar nuclear detonations. Rifle didn't find out about Sagan's potential trespasses until after the astronomer's passing, but it's arguable that Rifle ended up revealing more information than Sagan ever did. After the back and forth in Nature, a Freedom of Information request was made for Project A119. After 40 years, a study of Lunar Research Flights Volume 1 was made public. The other volumes, it turned out, were destroyed in the 1980s by the Illinois Institute of Technology. By cosmic coincidence, this was the same decade defined by more of Sagan's scientific secrets. Cosmos. From 1980 to 1990, the seminal science show, hosted by Sagan, 
was the most widely watched series in the history of American public television. Carl had a gift for revealing things. A gift greatly missed. Obviously, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union ended up nuking the moon. A Russian rocket engineer reportedly said that the USSR was worried about the nuclear warhead missing the moon. If the trajectory was off, the missile would flaccidly circle the sun forever, or catastrophically, fall back to Earth. The Soviet plan called for a nuke that would detonate on contact, and so returning to Earth it could possibly vaporize untold innocents, or start a war. Dr. Sagan had thoughts on that, too. She's worried. Uh, she is worried, and there's reason to be worried. But uh, the, you have to look at the issue, what constitutes strength? And since 1945, the universe of discourse has changed. As Albert Einstein said, he said, everything has now changed except our way of thinking. And so we drift to unparalleled catastrophe. The idea that more nuclear weapons make you safer is an illusion. Beyond a certain point, more nuclear weapons make you less safe. There's a far worse consequence if nuclear war breaks out, and there's more that can go wrong to make nuclear war. The idea is to reduce the arsenal safely on both sides to a minimum deterrent, so if the worst does happen, the global civilization and the human species are not imperiled. The U.S. never enacted Project A-119's projections. Indeed, most of the reports were destroyed. But America did nonetheless end up doing a powerful demonstration. It was meant to show both the Soviets and the American people that if space wasn't yet dominated by American nukes, the skies definitely were. On July 19, 1957, just months before the project report was published, a two-kiloton nuclear warhead exploded above the heads of five live volunteers during Shot John of Operation Plumba. There are scientific concerns deeply connected with the with uh, what we're talking about. I mean, the administration loves to, uh, to justify its activities in a kind of scientific smokescreen. Uh, I think it's important for scientists to speak out. If scientists aren't going to speak out on scientific issues, uh, who is? Until next time.